Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Gibbs with Gambling News. I'm here today with John Gordon, the co-founder and CEO of Incentive Games, a B2B software provider that, among other things, specializes in customer acquisition, retention, and monetization. Incentive Games has been serving the gaming industry for around nine years now, and this past March made a huge step forward as it entered the U.S. market through a new partnership with Interlock. John, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure. Um, now, I have to ask, your background is chemical engineering, correct? Correct. So how do you go from chemical engineering to gaming? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. So I was a lead chemical engineer for BP in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, about nine years ago, and I was writing algorithms um, for fantasy football at the time, and I was writing algorithms for betting on sports and soccer, um, and seeing if I could beat the bookmaker. Um, so we, it was my dream. We were, we were, I was writing algorithms for fantasy football, and I thought. I saw, I, being in Trinidad and Tobago, I saw all the adverts for Banjul and DraftKings. And I thought, maybe, maybe I could do this in the UK and, and do, do as well as we could. So, we, so I quit my job in, in Trinidad, moved back to the UK, um, founded the first version of this company, which was Premier Punt. And it was a B2C fantasy sports betting product. Um, and me and three of my founders, we're all chemical engineers or mathematicians, decided to put a little money aside and, and get a software company to build this product for us. It took us a few years, but we we launched a game, Premier Punt. We got a gambling license in the UK. And <clears throat> we all kept our main jobs at the time. But then um, we had relative success. We, we got to the number one search staff in the UK app store several times with this sort of side project that we were working on. Um, and then it became, it became apparent to us that the B2C fantasy, fantasy sports betting, although we were top of the charts and didn't have much outgoings, the 10% commission on peer-to-peer -peer betting wasn't going to be sufficient for us to sort of quit our jobs and become you know, fully focused on it. So mm -hmm. um, a few of us quit our jobs and we, we pivoted into being a B2B supplier. So we, we focused on, you know, supplying these games across the industry. Um, so from what became a, a sort of passion, fantasy football algorithms, uh, writing algorithms for fantasy football and betting became more of a, more and more became a bigger part of our lives until now we've, uh, me and one of the other founders, Stuart, we we got a job a few years ago in, in the oil industries and and really just focusing on rolling these games out worldwide. So what, what was one of our products was the fantasy football betting where we upsold to Sportsbook and Casino. We now sell that and many, many other games across the industry. Nice. Uh, things are definitely going really well for the company. So it's, it's nice to see that uh, someone can make that transition and still continue to be successful. Um, now, you're relatively new in the U.S. market, uh, but certainly making a name for yourself. What has been the response to uh, incentive, for incentive games since first entering the U.S. market? Um, so the U.S. market for me is, is, is a really intriguing one. When we saw it opening up a couple of years ago, a few years ago, we actually... We saw that happening about four or five years ago, mm -hmm. and we applied for a patent. Um, so we actually have a patent for our technology there, um, and we're we're looking for a strategic partner to use to work with on that patent. It's a sort of cross sell from fantasy to sports book, um, and for us, we saw there was a big rush into America, and whilst some of our competitors were focusing there, we actually focused in Asia. Africa, South America, Europe, mm -hmm. um, and we 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 essentially won a lot of work, and we've sort of great saw some great traction outside of the US. We saw we were strategically seeing how things panned out there, 
and now sort of entering the US market. But unlike what we did in Africa and across Europe, which is sign as many clients as you as we could, it's now a case of we are looking for one or two strategic partners there. You mentioned Interlot One, they're great, a, a great people to deal with. But you can imagine some of the, the market leaders in America um, sure. are looking to team up with us. So we just need to, for me, we we help our clients, you know, acquire and retain customers better than anyone in the industry. We Therefore, we know how valuable we are. And now it's a case of quality over quantity. And where, how can we really just focus on some of the top brands that can probably come to mind? And it's just really, rather unlike what we did elsewhere, let's just focus on one or two. And and how how are they how are they responding? So we, in terms of your second part of the questions, how how are the game has been responded? I think in in America, unlike anywhere else, it, reducing the customer acquisition cost, we, we've done it in UK, Europe, uh, mm -hmm. Africa, and South America. But the biggest challenge is reducing the customer acquisition cost in America. We all know oh, how high it is. We know we all know how. Uh, how valuable those customers are and you can you can see whether it be continue media better collective sky bet everyone's trying to do that golden thing which is acquire customers through some sort of free-to-play game mechanic or similar and reduce the customer acquisition cost significantly and when you do that you would then as you can imagine pile as much marketing spend into that funnel to get as much value as possible before the competitors catch up mm -hmm. now that to me is what i've seen going that's what we've done everywhere else and for me it's it's really about making sure that when we do that in the u.s it is with the right people because it's it's not just our games it's there's a lot of different things that need to line up for it to matter it's you know how how good is a client at marketing and branding and how generous can the client be with the reward so it's not sometimes people think oh, incentive games can you know, solve all the problems. The, the, the system needs to work upstream and downstream of our games. And only when we align everything well can we really see the benefits. So that's a long way of saying um, you, there will probably be some announcements in the next couple of weeks um, and the launches of our games. Uh, we've, been mar we've been doing a lot of research for a long enough time now. It's, now we're going to see a hopefully quite a big explosion of its set of games in the US. Nice. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing those announcements come out and, and see that explosion take place. You know, you, you mentioned the customer acquisition costs and, and that combined with all of the regulatory red tape that has to be dealt with um, in each state just makes it really a, a massive challenge to get involved with something like the US market. So Anytime you know a company can can launch in a new state, it's a, a huge achievement, and it's, there's certainly a lot that has to be put into it. Um, without having real knowledge on how much that investment is going to pay off in the long run, because it, the industry is is really still too young. Um, but it's we all know everyone expects the the iGaming industry in the U.S to continue to grow exponentially. Um, so getting involved now gives Incentive Games, you know, a, a leg up and will uh, allow it to be one of the, the pioneers for how the industry evolves over the next, you know, five to 10 years and, and possibly even beyond that. Speaking about breaking into the U.S. market, what have been some of the challenges that Incentive Games has had to face and, and overcome to access the market? It's a good question. So thanks, Eric. The interestingly enough, Incentive Games, uh, you know, no matter how much data we've got in America, sorry, in Asia, um, Africa, UK, and Europe, um, the challenge was maybe about a year or so ago when before we were so, um, better known um, any sort of failed startup in America with you know B2C that's now you know doing free to play games and, and they might not even have a, a live product or any sort of B2B model, model or data but they would have a sort of promo video 
and, and it would look all great and shiny and clean. Um, and we were sort of going up against guys like that. And then it was a bit demoralizing where, you know, I was like, you know, the, and Americans were, were tend to buying off these Americans. And I, I thought, you know, even without a product, um, we, uh, it made me, th and then, you know, they, they were sort of going in at almost nothing, if not sometimes for free. And it just wasn't for us, you know, we, we, we had to, you know, sell our games at a premium. So we sort of t pulled out a bit and let, let that go and see how that pans out. And now the, the same companies are coming back to us now saying, you know, okay, right, we'll try you now. So we, we don't do any marketing. We don't, we don't promote ourselves really. In fact, if you look at our LinkedIn, we're sort of self-deprecating, deprecating. <laughs> so we, we don't, uh, we're trying to not take ourselves too seriously. So um, it is more about, you know, hopefully the quality, the, the, what we're seeing to be done worldwide, it sort of speaks for itself. Um, and it, ha it has been sort of a strategic point of view, you know, let's just see how things go. And then belief in ourselves that we will come good in the end and, and be able to enter the market freely when, when word gets out really, which is well, what's I mean Sure, and it's obviously working um, because incentive has grown a, a substantial footprint, you know, mm -hmm. in several regions around the world. Apart from where you are now, and of course the U.S. access, um, where else are you currently targeting, or are you targeting in the other areas? It's a good question. So, I think what we are now doing is, I think. <laughs> interesting just rebranding like maybe not the certainly not the name or the logo but mm -hmm. currently you know our low strap line would say and not working with us you've got no game um now it is going to be more of a very strategic the, the number one and number two in each region so ukraine russia india the us we, we really just want to deal with uh, the number one and number two Mm -hmm. And we've sort of done a lot of hard, lot of hard yards and we do feel that we, we, we only have the capacity to really service the top echelon in those regions. So, like I say, I think America is a, is a real now uh, our number one focus. And then even you look outside of the US, the way we see it, it's like the US and then the rest of the world mm -hmm. and, and just the top, the top clients as you could they would probably come to your mind in each region mm -hmm. nice uh, it's probably a good strategy right now uh, as the global industry continues to change and there are still a number of questions that have to be answered about what's going to happen over the next mm -hmm. couple of years incentive games has a, a couple of interesting uh products running race and penalty kick among them how how are those being seen by the market? And tell me a little bit about the, the these offerings. So we we do have a lot of standard offerings like your typical sort of score selector games, margin selector games, bracket games. And um, for me, that was sort of, that was we we have them. They work. We've acquired millions and millions of customers using those games. And um, Actually, the, the, the newer, more innovative things are not on the website. We, we don't shout about it. We, we, do, we are we keeping it up our sleeve more. Um, you know, the, the score selector stuff, the, the quizzes and stuff are great, but I'm more thinking of post-purchase mini-games. What I mean by that is, you know, they've, they've confirmed their purchase, whether it be a bet or, or whatever that case may be, because we do non-gaming as well. And then they've got a chance to boost their odds by playing one of our, our semi-scale, semi-random number generator mini game, like rocket games or, or 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 similar. And so those are sort of exciting next generation stuff, or when the game is in play. So a single match of you know Manu versus Chelsea, we give them an immersive experience in play. Um so the, the in play stuff, the fantasy stuff we do. Um, the post-purchase mini games um, are really exciting for me, as opposed to you know what the the what almost anybody could do a score selector game, but we're sure. using a lot of our 
experience and knowledge to sort of, you know, what's next. And like I say, we don't even put it on our website because it's, I, I don't want anyone else to see what we're doing and until it's live. That's, that's fine. That's a good way to go. Um, it's always helpful when you're coming out with innovative solutions right now in the gaming industry, innovation is key. It's what's going to be the difference between those companies that survive, <clears throat> excuse me, for the next couple of decades and, and those that get pushed out um, because they're not willing to innovate. And there's so much competition right now that innovation is definitely going to be the, the factor that makes the difference. Um, and speaking of innovation and, and the advance of the iGaming industry, a question that I ask of everybody, and, and this is, you know, I'm looking for people's opinion, not so much on what the, the statistics say, but what is your opinion about where the iGaming industry is going to be five years from now in the terms of innovation, in the terms of, of even, you know, growth and the, the technology that's going to be driving the industry uh, at that time? Yeah, um, innovation in this industry is, I would, in my opinion, some of the worst, fat, slowest growing innovation than uh, compared to other industries. But I, I don't think that's because um, there's not great ideas out there. It, I think it's because, you know, if you're working with a client, and they've got, they could have 100 developers, they could have 600 developers, and the product people within their team are, are extremely bright and, you know, forward thinking, and everyone's seen the sort of growth hack documentaries and the Facebook stuff and everything, and everyone's got ideas about social sharing and, and creative products, but in-house and these operators, they they may have the ideas and the developers, but the developers are too busy working on business as usual they don't have time to do some sort of bespoke product or bespoke game and see how this works and um, so ultimately everyone just some a lot of them have the same product which is sports book casino um slots and such um and and as you can imagine the the software suppliers that's that the white label sports book even more so um it's just the same same stuff so where we can come in and, and provide bespoke products and bespoke uh, games and product differentiation is becoming more and more uh, a want and a need because they cannot do it in-house. In terms of where, where we're going to have an innovation in the industry, well, I mean, when was the last real innovation cash out or bet builder? Um, mm. And how many years has that been? I mean, I see some operators are now announcing that they've got bet builder as one of their products. I mean, it's... It's actually quite uh, funny. So I, I don't see changing too much now in the next few years, um, mainly because I know how much of a demand it is just to keep business as usual. For the behemoths, the, the, the top, top tier ones, are, don't have the luxury of, of you know, using developers' time to do anything else and making the product faster, more reliable, more scalable. Um, and ultimately, you know, this industry is sports book, casino and slots and such. So it is, that's their key focus. Um, I don't see it changing too much other than more, led, more and more countries have better legislation, more and more sure. com countries be more uh, regulated. And, and, uh, and those, those giants like the Fangios and DraftKings and Betsons going in and, and aggressively attacking those regions. Cool. That's, it's going to be interesting to see how things develop because there are, you know, so many changes. And, and I think that, um, like you said, there has been somewhat of a, a stagnant feel to the industry. Um, and part of it's because there's been such a push just to get out there by operators because there are so many new areas where they can uh, service that they've been putting all of the resources into launch and not so much into development. Um, probably down the road a little bit, they will, they'll start to ease up a little bit and open their doors to more innovation as they develop the foundation. So it will be interesting 
to see how the the industry uh, unfolds over the next five to ten years. I think I think that's a great point. I mean, if you look at, I won't mention their names, but there's public companies in America that that think you know, all the focus is on getting that new state regulated and, and being the first in that region. And that's great, you know, and that will boost our share price. And that's phenomenal. But, you know, you can, it's not like, you know, we can get a new state or we can look internal at a product and make our product the best in the world. You can do both. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, you, can, you, you, can, you can have focus, focus, focus on new, new states and, and new regions. But also, for me, product is everything for me. You know, you look at the Sky Bet product or Bet365, you talk about Sky owning the media in the UK. They do for Sky Sports. But if those, if they did not have the best product, you can own the media. You can, you know, I've seen it so many times before where they drive so many people to a product. And if it's not the best in class, if that, if that app or that website, the mobile website, doesn't work the way that Twitter and Facebook and Instagram works. No one's going to use it. It needs right. to be. It needs to be up there, and it, and and fast, instant. Um, use UX UI. I mean, that's another thing that's overlooked is the user experience stuff like that. So, for me, it is um, it look if you want to win the game, you mentioned it earlier about you know who innovation is going to you know are going to be the differentiator. I even think it's I'm not even up to that yet. It's like whose product you just make your product as good as it can be, fast, reliable, uh, UX, UI design, and and you'll you'll you win the race or you you survive the longest. Sure. That's a very good point. And it's that's part of the reason it's going to be so interesting to see how the industry develops. Um, because there are just so many different moving parts right now and and so much going on. So it's fascinating. I, I like being involved with it and I like seeing what's, mm-hmm. what's going to be coming down the pipe. Um, John, that's really all that I had on my list today. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, no, no. Um, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I look forward to listening to your other podcast and, and this one when it comes up. Sounds good. I look forward to seeing what developments and set of games is going to be coming up with over the next couple of weeks. So definitely stay in touch and we'll make sure to get the word out. Excellent, Eric. Well, thank you very much.